everyone, welcome back. We have now finished with all of the police units and now we're moving on to the second part of the criminal justice system. So if you haven't taken exam two, make sure you go back and that you review all the chapters, it's four, five, and six, and make sure that you take exam two. So now we will move on to chapter seven and we will talk about our third part of, or second part of our criminal justice system, which is the courts, okay? So that's what we're going to be talking about today. So remember the three components of the criminal justice system are police, courts, and corrections. We just spent the last three weeks talking about police. Now we're gonna spend the next couple of weeks talking about the courts. So I have one question for you. What role do courts play in the criminal justice system? So we said that police enforce the laws and maintain order and custom peace and tranquility and those kind of things. So now we wanna talk about what is the role of the courts? What do the courts do? What is their function? And there are three main functions for the courts, balancing rights, rehabilitation, and the, bureaucrat the bureaucratic function. So that's what we're going to talk about today, okay? So the first thing I wanna talk about is balancing interests. So at the very beginning of the class, we talked about this constant balance in criminal justice between due process and crime control. So remember we said due process model is a focus on individual rights. I apologize. Yeah, um, there's a reason. Okay, so the due process model believes in individual rights. So its sole purpose is to protect people um, from the state through due process. So you have certain fundamental constitutional rights and those rights should not be infringed since they're set forth in our constitution. That's an individual rights advocate and believes in the due process model. The second one is the crime control model. The crime control model believes that protecting society is the most important thing. And we need to punish offenders and enforce the laws. So when you're talking about the courts, you're really talking about both things. You're really looking at um, wanting to maintain that balance. So we have to have a system to try people and punish them if they commit a crime, that's the crime control part. But the judges also play another significant role they are making sure that the police do not violate people's rights. And if they do violate their rights, then they exclude the evidence. And that goes along with the due process model or the individual rights um, advocacy. Another function is rehabilitation. So rehabilitation is finding ways to cure or rehabilitate criminals. So the courts are not solely just to punish people. They're in a way to force people to get help and get rehabilitated. Now we can't just do that. The court, you know, you have to have a structure or an organization that has the ability to pull somebody in and actually force them to be rehabilitated. And that's really what the courts do. They give a forum to bring people in where they can actually be forced to undergo rehabilitation. And then the third one is they serve, it serves a bureaucratic function. So this is just a, Make sure we have, at night, I get sleepy. Um, this is to make sure that we have that process to actually put people through the actual court system, right? So the bureaucratic function is to make sure we have steps in a process to fairly try people and see if they actually committed a crime. So that's all the steps in the system, which we'll be talking about next week. Now, why do people follow courts? So what's really interesting is if you think about courts, they don't really have any enforcement mechanism. There's The police don't necessarily work for them. So if people don't follow the court rules, they don't have their own police to just to go out and arrest people or do things. So, but we believe in the rule of law, which we've talked about, and that's sort of what gives the courts some sort of legitimacy. So people will, follow the court, even though they don't really have any enforcement mechanism, if they believe they're legitimate. And two of the things that play towards legitimacy are impartiality, each side getting equal chance to present the case, 
and then independence. We don't want outside forces being able to influence what goes on within the courts. Those, so those two factors help contribute to the legitimacy of the court and the rule of law that we will be willing to follow what the court orders. Okay, so we have what's called a dual court system. That means the state courts and the federal courts are operating next to each other at the same time. And they're completely independent of each other. So you have all of the federal courts on one side and you have all of the state courts and they all operate at the same time. So I have posted a video, the differences um, between the federal and state system that you can watch and it can help you understand the distinctions. We will look at the specific courts in each system so that you can see that there is a difference. We'll talk about what's different with them. Sorry, this is the difference. This, the, I mean, this is the two courts. I just forgot to click on it. So the federal's on one side and the state's on the other. Now, within the court system, we have this thing called jurisdiction. We already talked about jurisdiction when we talked about policing. We kind of said it's a geographic area where the police can um, operate. And we said like the federal system, when we looked at the federal agencies, we said that they can also be got governed by subject, like certain agencies can only investigate certain subjects. And the courts have the same things. Courts have geographic jurisdiction. So we have state courts and then we have federal courts. So they have certain jurisdiction, but there are courts that only can hear certain types of cases and that's subject matter jurisdiction. So we'll look at that and talk about what those specialty courts are and who can bring their cases to those courts. Now, doesn't matter state or federal, there's always one set of courts that are what we call courts of original jurisdiction. This is subject matter jurisdiction, right? These are courts that um, are the first courts to hear the case. So that's why they're called original jurisdiction because they're the first courts that get to hear the case. So when you think of a trial, with a witness and prosecutor and defense and the jury and evidence and all of that stuff, that is gonna be what we call our trial courts. And they're the courts of original jurisdiction, the first to hear the case, okay? And generally that's all they can hear, that subject, the original cases. Now, if you don't like what happens at that court of original jurisdiction, you can appeal your case to a higher court. And those are what we call appellate jurisdiction courts. So they are courts that have the ability to review what happened in the court of original jurisdiction and make a determination if it was done properly. So appellate courts are always reviewing what the lower courts did to see if there's mistakes. Now they're very different from the courts of original jurisdiction because there is no jury, there's no witnesses, there's no evidence. So it's like in the picture, there's just a panel of judges and they're listening to the two attorneys standing there and sort of arguing why they believe there is or is not an error from below. So the witnesses don't talk, there's no juries and they're just reading mostly transcripts of what happened in the original courts. So they're just reviewing documents and stenographer notes and things like that to determine if there was an error. They don't hear from actual witnesses. And it's majority rule, whatever the number is, that's who gets to decide the case. That's how they do it, okay? Now, there are at the state level, other special courts that have um, sub subject matter jurisdiction. In New York, we have family courts and they can only hear certain kinds of cases. We have surrogate courts, we have bankruptcy courts. So those are all what we call subject matter courts. They can only hear cases dealing with those specific subjects. Okay, and these are all courts of original jurisdiction. So if you have one of these issues, you would go to these specific subject courts and they're the courts of original jurisdiction. And then if you don't like what happened in these courts, you can still appeal them up to the appellate division. Okay, oops, I went the wrong way. Now, we are going to learn now what the actual courts are. I posted a video called Crash Course Structure of the Courts, which is a really great overview of the system. I recommend you spending a few minutes to watch it, but we are going to talk about some of the specific courts that exist in each system. So when you talk about court system, they traditionally have like what we call like a three-tiered system. 
Okay. So usually they have like the lower courts, which are going to be county or municipal, which are city, town, and village courts. Then you're going to have like what we call superior courts. And then you have your first appellate court. And then you have your highest state court. So they have it, the county and municipal and superior are all broken up. But usually it's like the lower courts, one appellate court, and then the highest court. Okay. Now in New York, that's kind of how we have it. So these are what the ones were listed as. Um, so the city, town, and village would be your municipal courts. And then we have the county courts, which are here. And then this is, we call it Supreme Court, but that is what they were labeling superior court. And then we have an appellate division, which is the mid-level courts. And then we have our highest court in New York, which is the Court of Appeals. Okay, so we use different names in New York. When you look at the federal system, what we call our Court of Appeals, which is our highest court in New York, is actually a middle court in the federal system. And what we call our Supreme Court, which is actually a lower court in New York, is actually the highest in the federal system. So don't get them confused, okay? Now, below the red line, these are all courts of original jurisdiction. So they are going to be the first to hear the cases. If you don't like what happened in those court cases, then you appeal it to the appellate division. And then you can ask the highest court to hear an appeal if you want one more chance to, if you still think there were mistakes. Oops, I don't know what happened. Okay, now, one of the things I want you to know is what happens in each of the courts. So city, town, and village, these are municipal courts. These are gonna be like small claims matters, misdemeanors, a very low level crimes types of things. Um, so that's what occurs there. If you're actually tried with a felony, you have to be tried in what we call the county court. So every county in New York has one of these four courts, okay? So every county has a county court, family court, surrogate court, and court of claims. They're at the county level. The county court, now subject matter wise, the county court hears like felony cases. So if they're charged with a felony crime, that would go to county court. Then we have family court, which is juvenile matters, or it could be um, custody disputes or alimony types of disputes, things like that. Um, those are family court. And juvenile justice is also family court in New York. Surrogate court is anything to do with when people die and they have wills and estates that have to be um, saw, set, you know, figured out. That's surrogate court. And if you want to sue New York State, you can only sue the actual state in the court of claims, okay? So these are all what we would call subject matter and you have to figure out. So the county is the jurisdictional level and then you have to figure out which um, specific court at the county level has subject matter jurisdiction. Now we have another trial court, which is the Supreme Court. So every county in our state has a Supreme Court but it's considered higher than the county court because it's a statewide court. The, the court has jurisdiction anywhere in the state. We just put one in all the counties so they are easily accessible. And um, they do mostly civil cases. So once in a while you see a criminal case that's tried in the Supreme Court, but most of the time the, count, the county court holds all the felony trials, um, but the Supreme Court is mostly civil. So these are all our trial courts, courts of original jurisdiction. If we don't like what happened in these courts, then we can appeal to the next level up, which is the appellate division of a Supreme Court. And then if you want to try one more time, you can go to our highest court, which we call the court of last resort. This is asking permission though. When you wanna to go to one more court, you have to say, please judges, this is really important here, our case and they have to agree to hear your case, okay? Now, in New York, from Supreme Court down, all of these courts, these judges are elected. So we have elections and they run for office and they're elected. For the appellate division in New York, you first have to be a Supreme Court judge. So you have to run for election and win at the Supreme Court level. And then the governor picks from all Supreme Court judges and determines who should be on the appellate division, okay? And then, the, so this appellate division are elected and appointed. 
the Court of Appeals is completely elected by our governor, approved by the Senate. Okay, so that's completely elected. Oh, and I spoke too fast, so here you can see. All state court judges are elected except for Court of Appeals, which are appointed. And then don't forget the appellate division are elected and then appointed. And then in the county court or higher, you must be an attorney. Now, we also have different community courts that are at the county level. And these are really, really specific um, subject matter jurisdiction courts. They're kind of a new thing that have developed. The idea was that if you have courts that can really specialize in like hands-on certain types of cases, that you'll have more productive um, results. They're called problem solving courts. So, so a lot of counties have all three or one or several of these. So drug court, mental health court, and domestic violence courts. So these courts are designed to only handle those cases. So drug court only handles drug cases, mental health only handles cases where the defendant is suffering a mental health issue. And then a domestic violence case would go to domestic uh, violence court. The idea is having the, the defense attorney and the prosecutor and the judge and social workers and special agencies all work together to rehabilitate the defendant. So a drug court has drug counseling and you have to um, stay clean and you're tested and you report to the judge frequently. So instead of going to jail, we're going to really put you through this intensive program to try to rehabilitate you and keep you out of jail. So that's drug court and this health court and the domestic violence court operate the same way. If you're interested to learn a little more about this, I posted some videos on it. So they're really interesting if you want to learn a little bit more. Okay, so now let's look at the federal courts. Now in the federal system, we pretty much, um, or the federal court system was created by our constitution. So state courts are created by their state governments. The federal courts are created by the US constitution. Well, specifically the Supreme Court was, this, was um, created through this uh, article three of the constitution. So the constitution specifically says you must have one Supreme Court. And then it gave authority to the legislature federal legislature to make all other courts. And that was do, done through the Judiciary Act in 1789, I believe. So the Supreme Court has to exist according to the constitution. It's the only court that's specifically listed in the constitution in article three. And then Congress created all of the lower courts. Um, now, when we talk about a federal court, it's much pickier. So most of the traditional crimes, rape, murder, arson, all of those things that we we talk about in criminal law most of the time, those are all going to fall under state jurisdiction. State courts handle most of the criminal cases. But there are a couple of times where you would go to federal court, even for crimes. Um, so anything that's dealing with a federal question. So if people are saying their constitutional rights were violated, then you can go to federal court to have the court figure that out. Or if you're charged with a federal crime, which is a federal question, then you can go to federal court. There's one other way, it's called diversity, and this is mostly for civil cases. So let's say I'm driving my car in New York and I drive in, uh, I own my car in New York and I'm driving in Pennsylvania and I hit Joe in Pennsylvania and he lives in Pennsylvania. So I'm from New York, he's from Pennsylvania, where do we hold the case if I, he wants to sue me for hitting him? And since there's two different states, that's what's called diversity. And if you're suing for over a certain amount, then you can go to federal court because of the different states that are involved. So that's called diversity jurisdiction, okay? Now, we're gonna look at the individual courts, but it's important to remember that all judges in the federal system are appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. So all federal judges are appointed by the president, confirmed by the Senate, not elected at all in the federal system. The president always gets to appoint them. The other important thing to remember is that they are appointed for life. They sit in their seat until they decide to retire or until they die. The only way to get them out is if you actually go through a formal impeachment process in Congress, but otherwise they serve as long as they want or until they die. Okay, now this is the whole federal system 
you can see I crossed off a bunch of courts. These courts are really specific subject courts in the federal system. I just want you to basically understand these three courts. So district court is the lowest court, the trial court in our system. Court of appeals is where you would appeal if you want, if you think that there was a mistake at the lower court and you want them to review it. And then our highest court in our system is the Supreme Court. So when we're talking about jurisdiction, all the trials, original jurisdiction are going to occur at the district court level. That's our lowest court. And then when you want to appeal, you go up to the one level, the court of appeals. Okay, now US district courts, again, have original jurisdiction. So all the actual trials occur in the district court. So these are the courts that are going to determine if a person is guilty or not, if they are charged with a federal crime. And what they do is they take states and divide the states based on population into sections and they're described by geographic area. And um, so how many district courts your state has will depend, depend on population. So this just shows you in what district are we in. If you look here, there's a little line and we're here, so we are in the Western District of New York. Texas is a little easier to see. You can see the lines here. So they have Northern, Southern, Western, Eastern. So, and some states have zero, just one, their whole state is one district, okay? So we have four districts in New York, Western, Northern, Eastern, and Southern. And uh, we are in the Western District. Now, remember, if you don't like what happened at the trial court, you can ask the next level court to review the case, and then you would go to the U.S. Court of Appeals. So this is appellate jurisdiction. This is where you go to have them review the case for mistakes. Now, what they did is they lumped areas together. There's less appeals than there are original trials, so you need less appellate jurisdiction courts. So we only have 12 um, circuits. And you can see we are in New York, which is the second circuit. And then we have the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is the highest court in our system. I just got to move because so, sorry, it's going to be dark for one second. So the U.S. Supreme Court is our highest court in our system. And there are nine judges. Remember we said it's an appellate court. So it's appellate jurisdiction. They review court things for errors, okay? Now there are nine justices on the Supreme Court. They have original jurisdiction in a few cases. So there's a few things specifically stated in the constitution where they have original jurisdiction, but it's almost all appellate jurisdiction. If you want the Supreme Court to hear your case, you have to ask for a writ of certiorari. A writ of certiorari is when you are asking the Supreme Court to please, please, please hear your case, okay? And if they agree to hear your case, they issue the writ of certiorari, okay? So that's how you get to the Supreme Court. They pretty much get to take, choose all the court cases they want to hear. Now, um, one of the biggest things that the Supreme Court has the power is what we call judicial review. Judicial review is the Supreme Court's ability to review any statute to see if there is any constitutional violation. It is probably the biggest and most important power that they have because they can actually throw laws out if they view that they violate the Constitution. This came in a court case, Mulberry versus Madison, that many argue was the most important Supreme Court case in the whole system because it gave the Supreme Court power. Prior to that, the Supreme Court existed, but nobody really knew what they were doing, what they were going to be able to have the power to do. And so the court said, our power is to uphold our constitution and make sure that no laws ever violate the constitution. Now, when you're talking about appellate dec decisions, it's when you appeal, the decision of whether there was error or not is always made by the majority. So when you look at the judges, how many, many judges there are, seven or nine, it's usually odd number, you look at uh, who is the majority and whatever they decide is considered the majority opinion. Now, sometimes other justices disagree with that. 
And if they disagree, they can write their own opinion, which are called dissenting opinions. Now, sometimes they agree with the final decision but for different reasons. So we'll say, yeah, we agree with you, but we think it's for this instead. That would be concurring opinion. So they ag agree with the majority, but for a different reason, okay? Now, just for fun, this is the Supreme Court justices on the Supreme Court um, and when they were appointed. So you can look at the list. Uh, we follow what's called the rule of four. So anytime somebody asks the Supreme Court, asks for a writ of certiorari to review the case, there has to be four of these justices that agree to hear the case. That's the rule of four. You need at least four justices to want to hear your case. They get thousands and thousands of cases every year, and they only hear a couple hundred at the most. Now, so just as fun, I like to show the pictures and see how many Supreme Court justices you know. So who do you think this is? Oops, I don't have any of them. That is Brett Kavanaugh. And this one is Amy Coney Barrett. Sorry, I messed up. The other one. Who's this? That is, I don't know why it's doing that. So Sonia Sotomayor, Brett uh, Gorsuch, Gorsuch, and Elena Kagan. The clicks are all messed up. Any idea who that is? That is Stephen Breyer, and that is Samuel Alito. Sean Roberts and Clarence Thomas. So hopefully you'll get to know who they are a little better. Now we do have these things that are called dispute resolution centers. So sometimes in order to avoid going to court and having the court involved, we have people go to dispute resolution centers where they can work together to try to settle their disputes and keep them from having to go through the actual court system. So there's a mediator that helps them to negotiate and it's trying to lessen the amount of court cases that we actually have. Now, I posted online this name that court practice assessment so you can practice to make sure you understand your courts and what each court is responsible for doing. So you can take that. Remember, it doesn't count towards your final grade. It's just a way of reviewing. And then I have a little review here. So if you want to take a minute, try to fill it in stop the video, and then when you're ready, start the video, and I'll show you the answers. So hopefully you did well. So that is the end of the lecture for the court system. And we have one more lecture for this week. We're going to talk about what we call the players in the system or courtroom participants. And we're going to talk about the responsibilities for each of the different people that work in the courts. So I will see you soon with the next video. As always, if you have any questions, please reach out and I'll be happy to answer any questions. See you soon.